done is I have put in many points which define a circle. It's all these points here. The transformation is the same. Whoops. Who is moving my beamer? <laughs> Can you put it back, please? Okay. And now here I've put one, and you can see that the circle has become an ellipse. If I put in zero, the two circles are on top of each other. We have seen that before. If I make this two, then the circle will stretch in a horizontal direction into a horizontal ellipse. This is what William Scrotz made with his painting. That was only stretched in the horizontal direction. If I make this 0 0.5, then the ellipse will also shrink in that direction. In your uh, mathematics lectures, you probably have uh, understood that now I have given a matrix here that produces an ellipse, but the volume or the area stay the same. This one has stretched twice, and this one has shrunk to 50%. And I can really do anything I like. I can put in here minus one. And then I will get a new ellipse. So basically, by choosing these four numbers in two dimensions, I can get any ellipse I want. Hmm? So let's see if I put in here 0 0.3. Then, of course, the thing is going to get very small. And if I put back zero here and 0 0.3, Three, then the whole circle is very small and it looks like a fried egg and so forth and so forth okay so this is all very simple and I would encourage you to try it out and play with it okay homogeneous deformation as I have shown you looks really quite simple. Lines become lines, parallel lines are parallel lines, circles become ellipses. But some of the pictures that you get, some of the figures, can actually be rather surprising. For example, I made with my uh, drawing program a lot of faces, like this, and I just rotated the faces. Okay, I put them on a circle. And then I deformed this whole thing homogeneously. It was stretched a little bit, it was shortened. With just one of these matrices, I transformed every point in the left drawing to the right one. Maybe you already recognize that when you make deformations using your drawing program or PowerPoint, then you are doing this transformation in your computer all the time. But look here. The faces are now all different. Okay? This one is a rounded face. This is a very flattened face. And some of these faces have been sheared. Okay? So depending on where you are in this strain wheel, you can get quite different distortions, although the deformation is homogeneous. The only difference between all these faces is that they were oriented differently with respect to the main axis of the ellipse. Okay? So, lots of surprises. But the mathematics is extremely simple. And now if this happens, then... Okay? So, we have these four Ds. They are just four numbers. And this is the transformation equation. If you want to use the Einstein convention, then you can write it like this, dij times xj. This is the shorthand notation of this transformation. Okay. In 2D, this is just a repetition. It looks like this. And the reason why we are writing it like this and using it like this is because it can be very easily extended to three dimensions. Now, the, I have three coordinates of a point, x, y, z, or x1, x2, x3, coordinate axes, 
and now I have nine numbers, nine D numbers, but all the mathematics goes exactly the same. Now, let's go to the next little demo. So what I've programmed now is two of these D deformations. Of course you can do that. I can take my circle or whatever object, I deform it once, and then I deform it again. And this is of course very important, because if you imagine the formation of the Alps, two continents coming together, then rocks are deformed and they are deformed again and again and again many, many times. So the superposition of deformations is very important. So let's see, let me deform this by a shear. We have seen it before. So now this is the second tensor. And if I make the first tensor like that, then the first deformation is this pink one, the second deformation is this one, and the final deformation is like this. Okay? And I have here programmed for you the equations to calculate the long axis of the ellipse and so forth and so forth. They are all listed in the appendix of Ramsey and Huber. Very simple and very easy to look up. And if you understand these, then you can work with these deformation tensors, deformation matrices to summarize superposed deformation, one deformation after the other, is a matrix multiplication. You take the first matrix and with that you multiply the second. So the order is exactly the opposite of what you would want. And if you write it out, that's a nice thing, then you can derive algebraically that there is a new matrix which gives you in one step the operation of the two. And that is the result of this matrix multiplication. So the combined matrix has its one one component made out of these four, its one two component made out of these, <coughs> its two one component made out of these, and its to two component made out of these. And of course you can do this infinite the number of times. You can do it as many times as you want. You multiply the matrices and you can deform your ellipse into all kinds of shapes. And of course at any point you can come back to the original. Okay? That is the next equation that I want to show you. This is the inverse deformation matrix. The first component is this one, D22, divided by this determinant. This is the second component, this is the third, and this is the fourth. Okay? So here are the transformation equations, just for completeness. So if you have a deformation with the four components, you can very easily compute what matrix you need to deform your ellipse back into the original position. Of course, that is quite important to know also. Okay. So far, the mathematics. I think you have had the theory in your mathematics classes. Now I have programmed all these equations for you in our Excel sheet. So you go home and you can try it out. You can look and see that in the actual cells of the Excel sheet, we have put the right equations. And if you play around with it, say, for half an hour or for one hour, you really understand what is going on. Okay, so just to come back to this um, straight ellipse again, I now made not just a circle, but I also put these spokes in it. It is like a bicycle wheel. 
and then I've deformed it homogeneously. Uh, it is a little bit like the picture I've shown you with the faces. There is a change in length, a change in orientation, and there are these so-called principal directions. The change in length is something that is different in every orientation. So this line here becomes shorter. This line here becomes longer. This line maybe is more or less the same. Okay? And this line doesn't rotate. This line rotates quite a lot and so forth and so forth. So depending on which direction you are, you get more stretching or shortening and you get rotations. So imagine that I would have a rock where uh, in the geological past there was a deposition of belemnites. You all know what belemnites are, these cigar-shaped fossils. And I'm now looking down on a layer of rock and all these dead belemnites are lying there. And now I do a little bit of tectonic deformation and my original circle becomes flattened. Okay? This is what is illustrated by the wheel that I'm showing to you. Some of these belemnites is going to be shortened and squashed. Some of the belemnites is going to be stretched. Some of the belemnites is going to rotate. And if you would have the ability to sample one of these outcrops, then you could actually determine the strain. And in fact, if you go out after the lecture, you can look in the glass cabinet uh, in front of my office. There is one of these stretch belemnites. As you can imagine, it's quite rare, so we locked it up. But you can actually see that it was broken into chocolate tablet-like pieces and stretched. So, after we learn a little bit about the mathematics behind the strain, I will now tell you something about what we can do with strain in deformed rocks. And the idea is very simply illustrated by this. Okay? If we now have an object of which we know that all these different colors things used to be circles. That is the information that I give you. Then your job now is to give me the D tensor. Which D tensor produced this deformation? And if you know that, and if you can do this with fossils, with all kinds of different objects in geology, then you will be able to go out, do your fieldwork, and map the strain using all these different techniques. What we have now, the information is all of these <coughs> objects used to be circles. Okay? And what your job would be is to write down the deformation tensor D, which produces deformation using a coordinate system of your choice. And you have to state the assumptions you need to make so that you can solve this problem. Okay? And again, I can imagine that this could become one of the exam questions. So first of all, one of the main tricks, and many people make this mistake, is you have to choose your coordinate system right. Of course, a smart student chooses the coordinate system so that it coincides with the long axis of the ellipse and the short axis. Because then your matrix becomes rather simple two of the four are zero. There is only stretching and shortening. <coughs> so choose your coordinate system right. Of course, you can do it in any coordinate system. It will work. But then the matrix will